Cue and review, celebrating 40 years of audio production, welcomes you to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast, recorded from our studio in the Bishop Briggs Media Centre and by our volunteers working from home. Keep up to date with Cue and Review news via our Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, or Instagram, at Cue and Review, that's at sign, C-U-E, a-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W or get in touch with us directly by emailing information at qreview.com That's I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at sign C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling us on 0141 772-3979 Please like and share our podcast and give us constructive feedback. Evening Times Sport July 23 Nick Roger says Men's golf majors would surely benefit from more breathing space. I am not sure where the time goes, but I have just racked up my 25th Open Championship. I thought the R&D would have commissioned a limited edition commemorative dish clute to flog in the merchandise tent at Royal Troon, but they didn't. Maybe for my 50th? Anyway. If you were to document this glorious longevity in visual form, then it would probably look a bit like that old illustration that portrayed the ascent of man. You know, that one that starts with an ape-like figure shuffling around on all fours and slowly morphs into a striding upright human. Of course, my evolution at the open has slithered the other way, The descent of man, if you please. After a quarter of a century spent hunched, slumped and contorted over the laptop, your correspondent now resembles some primitive, grunting, knuckle-dragging ancestor of the bloomin' Gibbon line. The 152nd open is done and dusted. In fact, the tin lid has been shoved onto men's major season for another year. You have only got about nine months to wait until it all starts up again at the Masters. The interminable previews to the Augusta showpiece will probably start tomorrow. Oh look, there's a panning shot of Amen Ruddy Corner and some syrupy smokes about a few fluors to get you in the mood. The Masters, of course, has always benefited from this prolonged sense of anticipation. As for the other three majors, well, they come at us so quickly these days, you half expect to hear a panic shriek of four before ducking for cover. Everything is a complete frenzy, isn't it? Before a ball had been struck in anger at Royal Troon, All and sundry were being implored to enter the ticket ballot for the 2025 Open at Royal Port Rush before the deadline at the end of this month. These are breathless times, folks. The final men's major of the year arrived amid a riot of sport. Thank goodness England's football team did not win the Euros. The Open would have been relegated to the news in brief. Golf's ongoing fight for relevance in this frantic environment goes on. I don't know about you, but there's a niggling feeling of unfulfillment as I chisel away at this column. You probably have the same niggle reading the thing. The rotten summer has not helped. Let's face it, the last few weeks by and large have been as dank as Sonny Bean's cave. If you were at Troon on Sodden Saturday, 
you're probably still nursing a debilitating dose of trench foot. Sun-soaked TV footage displayed in the media centre, meanwhile, of yellow crisp fairways, sideburns and flares from opens of yore generated a certain wistfulness. Weather-wise, certainly in this unfailingly disappointing country, it feels like the golf season has not even started, yet the men's majors are already consigned to the history books. In a jam-packed schedule, there's a hectic desire to get them all out of the way as quickly as possible. I'm not really sure who benefits. You've just had 98 days between Scotty Scheffler slipping into the green jacket at the Masters and Xander Schofel kissing the claret jug at the Open on Sunday. Some folk have probably forgotten what happened at the US PGA Championship and the US Open, such as the crash-bang wallop nature of the calendar. Before you can say, let's sit back, reflect on the latest major, and savour its majesty, you're mired in a gloop of build-up for the next one. The scheduling of tournaments around the world can be a complex flustered palaver on a par with transferring various items into a different suitcase at an airport check-in when you've just been informed that one of the bags exceeds the weight limit. The high and mighty PGA Tour, of course, has to get its FedEx Cup playoff series shoehorned into the prime time before the American football season consumes everything on the other side of the pond. The rest of the golfing world has to pander to the demands of Uncle Sam, the self-centred sod. The DP World Tour, with a closing swing of decent events coming up after a lengthy break, has desires of its own to fulfil, while golf's return to the Olympics. The stroke pay event starts in Paris next week, has added another layer of complexity to this scheduling lark. In the years when there's not a Ryder Cup, there's a President's Cup, yet more stuff to squeeze in. To be honest, I would not mind if the Open got dunted back a few weeks into August, or we could just cut the whole field to eight players and hold it in October like the very first one at Presswick in 1860. The weather would probably be better than flipping July. I'm getting carried away there, but I'm just not a great fan of this April to July, blink and you'll miss it, major maelstrom. The golf writers will always find something to grumble about. It could be worse, I suppose. When Jack Nicklaus won his first United States BJA Championship in Dallas back in 1963, he achieved it just seven days after finishing third in the Open at Royal Lytham. There was barely a spare moment to burrow the simmets and socks through the mango for the fraught transatlantic turnaround. Here in 2024, the men's majors have passed in a flash. As my 25 opens prove, time really does fly says Nick Roger. Evening Times Sport July 23 Primary teacher turned MMA pro on preparing for Hydro debut. Report by Graeme McPherson Enforcing discipline in the classroom should not be a problem for Gemma Ald. The Ayrshire primary school teacher is discovering there are not enough hours in the day as she juggles the commitments of the day job with her burgeoning talent as a mixed martial arts MMA combatant. After arriving relatively late to the sport, the 33-year-old has enjoyed a meteoric rise over the past 12 months, 
quickly racking up a 6 nothing amateur record and a clutch of gleaming trophies to go with it. Struggling with a lack of suitable opponents, a move into the professional ranks seemed an inevitability, and it is Professional Fighters League, PFL, who have now afforded Ald that opportunity. As she prepares both for the start of the new term and also her professional debut at the Hydro in Glasgow on September 28, Ald admits it's all been a bit of a whirlwind trying to combine her dedicated training programme at the famed higher level gym in Bathgate with teaching. Turning professional is a big step, so I am still trying to figure a way to make it all work, says the Kilmarnock based fighter. After the summer, I'm going back to school part time, which is good, as it means I can join the pro training sessions in the morning. Being able to call that my work is a massive thing for me, although I'm still going to be teaching four days a week but I'll figure out a way. I had not really targeted turning professional this summer, but I knew I was going to start running out of amateur fights. So when the opportunity came up with PFL, I knew I could not say no to that. The timing was perfect, and getting the chance to make my debut at the Hydro could not be better. Usually, I do not normally have friends at my fights, but I've opened this one up to everyone as it's such a big event. I went to the PFL show in Newcastle to get a feel for it, and now I can't wait to fight at the Hydro. Ald admits becoming a professional athlete was not in her thoughts growing up when her brother and sister were the ones in the family considered to have the bulk of the sporting talent. A chance introduction to Mu Tai, however, led her eventually to MMA training and then, after a while, competing. And she recalls, I have been training consistently, probably since I was 20, and then when my gym closed, I went to a wee Mu Thai gym, just to keep doing weights mainly, as it was near my house. I then started doing classes for fitness, and then found there was an MMA gym in Ayrshire, so went along to that. At that point, I was just striking, but got convinced to try MMA. I started doing GU Jutsu, and loved it straight away. I was getting beaten in every round and still enjoying it. I wasn't sure if I ever wanted to fight, as I thought the pressure of that would ruin the fun of training for me, but I started doing well in the Jiu Jitsu competitions and decided to try it. I had my first fight in June last year and got a first round finish, and it just grew from there. I'm so glad now that I gave it a go. People ask how I got into MMA, but it wasn't a clear path I followed or anything like that. It just sort of happened. It will be the same in the pro ranks. I just want to prove that I belong there. Ald has made no attempts to hide what she does in her spare time from her pupils. Quite the opposite, in fact. The 10 and 11 year olds she teaches are among her biggest fans especially when the teacher brings in her medals and trophies for them to hold. Her enthusiasm has also led to some of the children giving martial arts a go themselves. And she adds, I've been teaching now for eight years and I love it. We've got a gym in Kilmarnock that does moo tai for kids, and a lot of them go to that and are quite into it. They all watch my fights on YouTube and are really excited at the thought of me fighting at the Hydro. They were among the first people I told about my contract with PFL on the day it got announced. I was teaching primary six last year 
So they were all 10 or 11, so they all know what's going on and understand what I'm doing, which is pretty cool. Everyone always says they must be so well behaved given what I do, but they're just as cheeky as any other kids. Report by Graham McPherson Evening Time Sport July 23 Scotland striker heads for Torino Report by Martin McMillan Scotland international Che Adams has joined Serie A outfit Torino on a free transfer. The 28-year-old, who was part of Scotland's Euro 2024 squad, has penned a three-year deal with the Turin club following the expiry of his contract with Southampton. Adams scored 16 goals for Saints last season as they won promotion back to the Premier League, but has turned down the offer of a new contract. He leaves St Mary's after scoring 49 goals in 191 games. A club statement from Torino wished Adams a warm welcome to the Stadio Olimpico. On Instagram, Adams shared a farewell message with Southampton supporters and wrote, Thank you, Southampton Football Club. I am so grateful for the last five years. Southampton became home to me and my family, and we were surrounded by some amazing people and players. Thank you to everyone from the backroom staff to the kitchen staff to the coaches for all your support and guidance since I stepped into Staplewood in 2019. I am proud to be leaving with my head held high, getting this club back to where it belongs. We made you, the fans, a promise, and it gives me such pride we delivered. Thank you for all the support. You have followed us home and away in incredible numbers, and it meant so much. Wishing you all the best for the future. Report by Martin McMillan Evening Times Sports July 24 the 34 Scots in Team GB at Paris Olympics. Report by Andrew Smart. The Olympics are starting in Paris and thousands of athletes from hundreds of countries are descending on the French capital. 34 athletes from Scotland will be competing in Team GB and this is the list. Athletics. Neil Gourley, age 29, in the 1500 metres. Megan Keith, age 22, 10,000 metres. Josh Kerr, age 26, 1500 metres. Eilish McColgan, age 33, 10,000 metres. Laura Muir, age 32, 1500 metres. Nick Percy, age 29, discus throw. Gemma Ricci, age 26, 800 metres. Jake Whiteman, age 29, 800 metres. Nicole Yergin, age 26, 4 by 400 metres relay. Badminton. Kirsty Gilmer, age 30, women's singles. Psyching. Charlie Aldridge, age 23, men's mountain bike. Jack Carlin, age 27, men's sprint and team sprint. Nia Evans, age 33, women's Madison and Omnium. Diving. Grace Reed, age 28, women's 3 metres springboard. Equestrian. Scott Brash, age 38, individual and team jumping. 
Hockey. Amy Costello, age 26. Lee Morton, age 29. Sarah Robertson, age 30. Charlotte Watson, age 26. Rowing. Sholto Carnegie, age 29, men's 8. Rowan McKellar, age 30, women's 8. Rugby. Lisa Thompson, age 26. Sailing. Anna Burnett, age 31. Mixed Nacra, 17. Finn Sterrett, age 36. Men's 49er. Shooting, Sinead McIntosh, age 28, 10 metres air rival, 50 metres three position rifle, and mixed team 10 metres air rifle. Swimming, Kathleen Dawson, age 26, 50 metres backstroke, 100 metres backstroke, 4 by 100 meters mixed relay. Lucy Hope, age 27, 200 meters freestyle, 4 by 200 meters freestyle. Kiana McInnes, age 22, 200 meters butterfly. Duncan Scott, age 27, 200 meters freestyle, 200 meters individual medley. 4 by 100 meters freestyle relay and 4 by 200 meters freestyle relay. Katie Shanahan, age 20, 200 meters backstroke and 400 meters individual medley. Taekwondo, Rebecca McCown, age 24, plus 67 kilograms category. Tennis, Andy Murray, age 37, men's singles and doubles. Cameron Norrie, age 28, men's singles. Triathlon, Beth Potter, age 32, men, wo women's and team triathlon. Evening Times Sport, July 24. Race to Iceland underway for St Mirren. Report by Graeme McPherson. The Renfrewshire edition of Race Across the World is now in full swing. Getting to Iceland from Scotland would not ordinarily be a huge undertaking, but given the paucity of summer flights and the rate with which the price rocketed once it became clear St Mirren would be heading there instead of Albania for their return to the European arena. It has required supporters to show greater invention and patience when planning their route. Around three to four hundred are now expected in Reykjavik for tomorrow night's Conference League second qualifying round first leg against Balur, and few have flown direct with some going via layovers as diverse as Dusseldorf, Latvia, Amsterdam and even Budapest. Tip of the hat must also go to one former wearer of the Paisley Panda suit, Colin Bright, who has made the long trip from his new home in Melbourne to ensure he does not miss the club's first UEFA tie since 1987. Now that's dedication. Stephen Robinson is well aware of how significant a moment this is for many Saints supporters who have watched fans of other sides head off to Europe over the past four decades with increasing levels of jealousy. The manager has left no stone unturned in his preparations believing his team can put in a strong first leg performance that would then give them a great chance of progressing to round three in front of a sold out SMISA stadium next Thursday night. 
the northern Irishman said. Fans see it as an adventure, but this is what fans have to do. They go through all the bad times. They pay an absolute fortune to watch their football. So they have got to enjoy these times. The home match will be a fantastic experience, but we have to make sure we come back for the second leg, very much in the tie, if not ahead. That would then give them something to cheer us on for, with the even bigger incentive of trying to progress. I believe this is only the fifth time the club has been involved in European football, so that speaks volumes for what the players have achieved. But we don't want to go out with a whimper, we want to progress. There is a big incentive for us to progress with this week's draw for the next round. But I've been to see Valour, I've watched quite a lot of footage, and they'll be a tough nut to crack. They are a good side who have started the Icelandic season very well. We have to overcome that hurdle, but certainly there's a big goal to be achieved if we can progress. Robinson went out to Iceland to watch Valur take on Villas Naya in the previous round and has also been poring over hours of footage from recent league matches. The element of surprise should not be in Valur's armory. And Robinson added, I've been out there myself and my chief scout Martin Foyle has been doing a lot of digging on them as well. The world's a smaller place now, so we've a lot of footage of them from their last six league games. There's as much preparation being done as if we were playing Celtic, Rangers, Hearts or Hibs. It's hard to compare levels. It's hard to compare the Icelandic league to the SPFL. What we do know is that they have some very gifted technical players, the biggest one being Gilfey Sigurdsson. They are very well coached, very organised, with a style of play that means they are a possession-based team. But this gives us an opportunity to go and press them and put our game onto them. Recent St Myrna recruit Sean Rooney misses out due to a suspension picked up while with St Johnson. But there is better news on Alex Jacobiti and Scott Tanzer, who have both been nursing injuries. Explained Robinson, Alex came off not long after coming on against Carlisle, which was a concern at the time. But we feel it's more of a back and neural issue than an actual hamstring strain. When you see a hamstring injury, you fear the worst straight away. But we have the best physio in the UK in Jerry Doherty. And when he tells me there isn't much to worry about, then I sleep a wee bit better. We're quietly hopeful he could be involved in the second leg. Scott's a very fit boy and we're hoping he will take a place on the bench minimum. He gives me real competition and options. He is back fit again. He has had an injection in his back and he has responded brilliantly to that. Report by Graham McPherson. Evening Times Sport July 24 Rogers confident of Celtic signings. Report by David Irvin. Brendan Rodgers has insisted he is confident Celtic will land their summer transfer targets after a long meeting with Michael Nicholson and Christopher Mackay. The Parkhead boss met with the Chief Executive and Chief Financial Officer for a transfer briefing in the United States, and the discussion has left Rodgers expecting the club to bring in his preferred targets this summer. So far, Celtic have signed goalkeeping pair Kesper Smeichel and Viljami Sinisalo. Speaking after the friendly win over Manchester City, Rogers said of transfer business, I had a long meeting with Michael and Chris today. 
We know the targets we want to bring in. While the club is getting on with that, myself and the coaches were really focused on the improvement of this team physically, tactically and technically. Yes, at some point before the end of August, I would expect us to have the players we want in. Celtic have been credited with their continued interest in Paolo Bernardo this summer after the midfielder spent last season on loan from Benfica. A buy option was included in the deal, but it's thought Celtic were keen to negotiate a lower fee than the reported £6 million cost. Quizzed on any update on a permanent deal for Bernardo, Rogers added, There's nothing new to add. Clearly there's lots of work going on behind the scenes. But until there is any confirmation on it, we'll let you know. I'll make it clear to the Celtic supporters, we want to improve. We want to get better. We don't want to stand still this season. We know we want to improve the squad and by the end of the window shutting, I would expect us to be that. Until that moment, there is a lot of great work going on here with the players. Some of the younger players are developing really well. The other players are really tuned into how we are working and are having a good pre-season, which is a good starting point for the season ahead. Report by David Irvin Evening Times at Sport July 24 St Johnson to a rename main stand in tribute to former owner Report by Robbie Hanratty St Johnson have announced plans to rename their main stand in tribute to former owner Jeff Brown recognising his significant contributions to the club. The ceremony is set to take place before the first Scottish Premiership match of the season against Aberdeen on August 5. Brown, who served as chairman for 25 years, from 1986 to 2011, played a pivotal role in the Perth-based club's development. After stepping down, he passed the leadership to his son, Steve, before the family sold the club to American attorney, Adam Webb, this summer. In addition to the stand renaming, Brown will be honoured as life president of St. Johnson. While the main stand at McDermott Park will now bear the name Jeff Brown Stand. St. Johnson claim they are indebted to Brown after he planted the foundations for growth and provided the platform which allowed us all to savour unparalleled joy both on and off the field of play, including consistent top flight success, European adventures and historic club cup victories. New owner Webb told Saints official website Jeff's contribution to St. Johnson over 38 years has been nothing short of heroic. I hope that all supporters will make extra efforts to attend and bring family and friends along on August 5 for what should be a magical night at McDermott Park. Report by Robbie Hanratty Evening Times Sport July 24. Team GB hire former weather forecaster to boost bid for Meadows Hall. Report by Martin McMillan. Team GB have hired former BBC weather forecaster Penny Tranter as they look to find the extra 1% in their bid for a bumper medals haul at the Paris Olympics. As well as providing daily weather reports, Tranter, who worked for the BBC from 1992 to 2008, has been brought on board to predict longer term patterns amid fears these games will be the hottest on record. Temperatures in the French capital are currently in the mid-20 degrees Celsius, 
but it is forecast to get even hotter by the middle of next week. In an attempt to offset the carbon footprint, Paris organisers have ruled out a number of initiatives, the most high profile of which is following the lead of Tokyo 2020 and having all beds at the Olympic Village made from recycled cardboard. To improve sleep for their own athletes, Team GB have brought 942 blankets and 578 mattress toppers. UK Sport has issued a target of between 50 and 70 medals for Team GB in Paris. If they win 70 medals, it would represent their best results at an overseas Games, overhauling the 67 they won at Rio 2016. 6,500 bags of sweets and salted popcorn, over 1,000 bottles of squash, 200 boxes of 500 grams cornflakes, 945 boxes English breakfast tea, 47,250 tea bags, 22,000 cereal bars, over 1,000 boxes of muesli, 700 jars of whole earth peanut butter, nearly 1,000 bags of dried mango. They have also brought with them a freight weight in excess of 22 tonnes in food and drink supplies alone, which includes 6,500 bags of sweets, salted popcorn, 22,000 cereal bars, 700 jars of whole earth peanut butter and more than 1,000 boxes of muesli. More than 1,000 bottles of squash have also been brought across the channel, as well as 945 boxes of English breakfast tea, estimated to contain 47,250 tea bags. A total of 85,000 items of kit have been distributed thanks to the efforts of 400 staff and volunteers. Report by Martin McMillan. Evening Times Sport, July 25. Todd Cantwell will not be missed by Rangers fans or Clement, says Graham McGarry. He came he shushed, he left. The only surprise is that the news of Todd Cantwell handing in a transfer request at Rangers was delivered by manager Philippe Clement rather than on his social media feed. He still has to find another club, of course, and it is debatable whether Clement revealed to the world that he is desperate to move on is the best starting point in negotiating his transfer. But that is now by the by. The real question here is how a player who is clearly among the most technically gifted at the club and who would profess his undying love for Rangers and kiss the badge at every turn has reached the point where he wants out. From the moment I arrived to this moment now, I feel as if I've been a Rangers fan my whole life, Cantwell said last October. I promise you, however long I play here, and as a footballer that is definitely out of your control, I will always follow Rangers 100%. Because the club to me has been immensely powerful and it has made me fall in love with football again. There is a big expectation, a big pressure. I love it, I love it, because I know that me going out there and giving 100% and me going out there and playing the way I want to play with a little flick here and a little trick there, they love it because they love football and they love people that care. Leaving aside the ironic comment about his Rangers future being out of his own hands, 
it seems that pressure finally got to him. It's a love story, Cantwell once said about his relationship with the Ibrox support. But to paraphrase the song Rangers supporters used to sing about him, they found a love, but it didn't last. Cantwell is a paradox. On the one hand, he worked hard when he was on the field and seemed, at least at first, to know what it was to represent Rangers, to get it. And in person, he came across as affable and even, at times, humble. On the other, his social media output, most infamously his shush burger post after a draw with Hearts on the final day, angered fans, and he often seemed to spectacularly misjudge the mood among the supporters and fail to live up to the standards they expect from their players off the field as well as on it. There's nothing wrong with a bit of arrogance in a footballer, but as gifted a player as Cantwell is, he's often looked mis misplaced. In fact, shutting him up became a motivational tool the Celtic players used in the end, reveling in their league and cup double by mocking him on the very social media platforms that caused him so much grief. I don't want to be too harsh on Cantwell because I have never played for Rangers and so have no idea what it is actually like to deal with the level of scrutiny he was subjected to. He said before, after yet another ill-judged post, that he is swamped with abuse every single day and a lot of that came from Rangers supporters. Such is life at a big club. While understanding that it cannot have been easy to handle that level of vitriol, you cannot on the one hand court the supporters and promise them the world, and then recall in horror if they react badly when you fail to deliver. This was a man who photoshopped 56 onto his shorts in a picture and will leave Ibrox with a solitary League Cup medal after all. It is interesting that Clement chose to return to his press conference after the dismal friendly defeat to Birmingham City on Wednesday night to deliver this news unprompted. It may have been deflection, but for all his talk of the good relationship he and Cantwell enjoyed, it backed up the suspicion that the Rangers manager has never really taken to the former Norwich City man, a seed that was planted when he hooked him in the first half of a Europa League tie against Aris last November. There were also big matches where he was left out, suggesting Clement still did not fully trust him to follow his instructions. Most notably, he watched on from the bench for the entirety of Rangers' defeat to Celtic in May that ended their title hopes, with Clement saying it wasn't a game to put him on after Rangers were reduced to 10 men. He was recalled for the Scottish Cup final against the same opposition, where he was hooked with 20 minutes to go and was shoved away by his manager after the match as he remonstrated with the officials. As was the case for much of his time at Rangers, the headlines that day regarding Cantwell were focused on what he did outside the game rather than the influence he had within it. And that rather neatly summed up his Ibrox experience. In the end, it is clear that is what he will be remembered for more than his contribution as a player. A gifted footballer, no doubt, but who perhaps was not half as good as he thought he was. The love story is over, and I doubt too many of the club's fans are heartbroken about it. In the end, his Rangers career added up to one great nothing burger, says Graham McGarry. Evening Times Sport, July 25. Nicholas Kuhn shines in USA Tour. Report by Joe Donnelly. 
Nicholas Kuhn shone in the 45 minutes he played against Manchester City during the Celtic USA Tour 2024, scoring twice and assisting once in the 4-3 victory. Both of the midfielder's goals were taken well, but his superbly weighted outside of the foot pass in behind the opponent's back line to assist Kyogo ahead of half-time showcased immense skill. Manager Brendan Rodgers hailed the 24-year-old's contributions at full-time and suggested the best is yet to come from the German, the same sentiment the player himself expressed in a media conference earlier this month. At the beginning of July, Kuhn said, It feels like my Celtic career starts now. That is the goal. I just want to have a good pre-season, stay fit and show everyone. Yes, I hope it's time for the real thing after the introduction. Signed in the January transfer window from Rapid Vienna, the German midfielder spoke candidly at the time about the agonising dental surgery that left him unable to eat for 12 days just weeks before arriving in Glasgow. The ensuing weight loss left the 24-year-old with an unusual road to recovery, fit to play yet physically hindered as a result of his rapid and fairly extreme weight loss. The midfielder nevertheless made 18 appearances under Rodgers in the back end of the domestic campaign but suggested he was only beginning to hit his stride in fitness terms when Celtic overcame Aberdeen on penalties in the Scottish Cup semi-final at Hamden in April. Now he wants nothing more than to use the new season as a starting block for what's to come. And while Celtic's 4-3 win over English Premier League champions Manchester City was only a friendly Kuhn's efforts bode well for the campaign ahead, says Joe Donnelly. Evening Times Sport, July 25. Andy Murray withdraws from singles at Paris Olympics. Report by Joe Donnelly. Andy Murray has announced his withdrawal from the men's singles at the Paris Olympics 2024, which marks his retirement from singles tennis, all told. In a statement, the Scotsman said he will instead focus on his men's double partnership with Dan Evans. The 37-year-old's confirmation of withdrawal from the men's singles follows statements made on Wednesday evening. Said Murray, I need to make that decision on being fit enough to play singles tennis, but I don't think so. Obviously, Dan Evans and I have made the commitment to each other that doubles was what we are going to prioritise. I think Dan is still going to play singles, but last week he did a lot of doubles practice. That's what I was predominantly practising in training when I was in Greece, and since we've been here, we've been practicing and playing double sets together. That gives the team and us the best opportunity to get a medal, realistically. My back is still not perfect, and the potential of playing two matches in a day is maybe not the best. Report by Joe Donnelly. Evening Times Sport, July 25. Why Rangers are overthinking £3 million Lawrence Shanklin transfer? Report by Johnny McFarlane. Just do it. A slogan for the ages that helped propel Nike to become the world's premier sports brand. It's three words that suggest action, Swift and clear and decisive, Rangers should take heed. For years now the club has lacked a goal scorer. What about Alfredo Morales, I hear you cry? Well, the Colombian may have been a one-man wrecking crew in the Europa League 
where he remains the competition's third highest goal scorer. But in the Scottish Premiership, his top season tally was just 18. Even that was an anomaly. As an average, Morelos was a 13 goal striker in the league across his six years in Govan. That's nowhere near what a main man needs to be at this level to secure titles. The incumbent forward, Cyril Desers, is an honest trier but lacks the quality to be a game changer. He misses huge chances with regularity and lacks the finesse to link the game to a standard required at the cutting edge of our game. He is not the answer. Clement knows this and you can expect him to move on with everyone's best wishes. Many more have tried and failed to offer a spark similar to what Kyogo brought to Celtic under Ange Postecoglou. So this is not a short term issue. A 2025 league goal scorer striker wins you titles and cups. Rangers could do with finding one. And yet an hour's drive down the M8, there's a simple zero risk solution to all of this. Last season, Lawrence Shanklin scored 31 goals for Hearts. He scores all types, long ranges, volleys, free kicks, poached trundlers, and is capable of the truly spectacular. He is also a reliable penalty kick taker, something that will be needed if James Tavarney is to move on, as expected. A Rangers fan growing up, Shankland is also understood to be open to a move to his boyhood heroes, should they come calling. So why hasn't an offer gone in? Some key figures at Rangers have asked the same thing. But while manager Philippe Clement and transfer guru Nils Coppen respect the player, they are not sure he fits the bill in terms of his age at 29. The expensive price of the transfer for a player with only a year on his contract, nor his ability to play in a team that expects its number nine to engage in a highly energetic press. With Europe and Celtic matches in mind, this is understandable, but it is to overthink the rough and tumble of the rest of Scottish football. We are a gloriously archaic league at times, and the combined impact of our weather and how referees enforce the laws of the game with leniency means pure football ideology can be a tough solution to the problems posed. Possibly Congo managed it, but there's a reason this true one-off moved to a Premier League giant. For other coaches in the Scottish game, there is a massive emphasis on set pieces, eliminating mistakes and being defensively robust. If you add quality in attacking areas to that, you can be a serious force. Look at Kilmarnock's brilliant rejuvenation under Derek McInnes, or Celtic last season, who were all about moments. It was not always pretty or cohesive, but they got there most of the time. Their quality was what showed up in those final weeks when the title going got tough. Shankland may be 29. It may take the guts of £3 million to force Hearts to play ball. But he offers what nobody else does. Guaranteed Premiership goals. It doesn't matter how talented or skillful or quick a player coming in from abroad is. They don't give you that. We've seen players with outstanding technical quality come in and struggle in the rough house that is our game. Look at Sam Lammers just last season, a dud in Scotland, and a revelation in the much tougher Dutch top flight. That certainly is worth paying a premium for. If Rangers want to win titles and cups in Scotland, they need players who are proven performers. When it comes to Shankland, they need to adopt a Nike mentality and just do it, says Johnny McFarlane. Evening Times Sport, July 26. Bill to ban greyhound racing earns support. 
report by Mark McDougall. An MSP has said the writing is on the wall for greyhound racing after a bill introduced to ban the sport in Scotland gained enough support to proceed at Holyrood. Mid-Scotland and Five Green MSP Mark Ruskell said his member's bill had won the backing of enough colleagues at the Scottish Parliament to allow it to be introduced. The bill aims to make it an offence to permit greyhounds to compete in races at tracks in Scotland. Data from 2023 showed 109 greyhounds died at trackside in the United Kingdom, which was up from 2022, and a further 4,238 were injured last year. He said, I am delighted to have received the backing of MSPs from across the political spectrum and will be pushing ahead with my member's bill. I hope that the Scottish Parliament will unite behind my proposed legislation and take the chance to act and to save the lives and limbs of countless greyhounds in future. My bill aims to protect greyhounds from the many risks that come from being forced to race around tracks at high speed. With industry figures showing that the death rate is going up across the UK, it is time to take action. Public opinion is on our side, and I am heartened by the support that my bill has received so far. I urge racecourse owners and the wider industry to listen hard and to stand up for Scotland's greyhounds by putting pause before profit and ending the races for good. You can tell a lot about a society from how it treats voiceless animals. I believe that we are a nation of dog lovers, and that is why we need to ensure they are protected. The writing is on the wall for greyhound racing in Scotland. It's time for us to put the well-being of these wonderful dogs ahead of gambling company profits. Report by Mark McDougall. Evening Time Sport, July 26. Green Brigade in final plea. Report by Joe Donnelly. The Green Brigade have issued another plea to Celtic supporters ahead of the club's official Celtic Football Club fan survey deadline later today. The unofficial fan group desires the club to rework the current stadium seating layout in order to facilitate a larger behind the goal standing section which would require a large portion of existing season ticket holders in the Jockstein stand to relocate. In conjunction with like-minded unofficial fan group The Boys, the Green Brigade launched the Celtic End last year, a fan-led initiative which is indirectly addressed within the Celtic Football Club fans survey to which both groups wish fans to address favourably in their responses. The extensive multiple choice questionnaires deadline is 5pm this evening. Here's how Celtic described the survey itself. The club has launched the Celtic fans survey 2024 and we would love to hear your views. This will be the biggest ever survey of Celtic supporters worldwide commissioned by the club as part of our ongoing commitment to fan engagement. With the help of the University of Strathclyde's Business School, we have designed the survey to give you a voice in shaping the future of our club. Whether you are a season ticket holder in Glasgow or a fan from afar, your views matter to us. The survey takes about 25 minutes to complete and automatically enters you into a prize draw to win a 24-25 Celtic FC Adidas bundle, which includes all you need to be ready for the season ahead. Evening Times Sport, July 26. David Irvin looks back on the visit of St Mirren fans to Reykjavik. 
A looping trailer cycles through various must-see attractions in Reykjavik and beyond. Iceland there were giving their best sales pitch as a short delay for takeoff allowed for excursions and tour offers to be etched into the memory of all on board as the St Mun fans headed out on Wednesday for their European clash in Reykjavik. There's the Golden Circle Tour, including visiting the spectacular geyser area, Gullfoss Waterfall and Pingvela National Park, the Blue Lagoon offering the chance to relax in soothing geothermal waters, whale and puffin watching tours departing a stone's throw from the Harper Concert Hall. All of that before a midnight journey into the country for the most aesthetically pleasing shot of the Northern Lights and a ticket offer for the Perlan Museum for the Wonders of Iceland exhibition. All of that before St Myrne were due to meet Valur in the Hildernde Stadium. At that stage we were all wondering when would they advertise the stadium, the home of Valour FC, and the destination for the few hundred St Myrne supporters ready to watch their club in Europe for the first time in 37 years? The capital city of Iceland has traces of Viking history and volcanic activity. It will be St Myrne's supporters arriving on the shores and raiding pubs and bars before hoping to erupt in celebration at the neat home of Valour. It's a friendly, welcoming city where almost every nervous interaction results in the same smiling response, Scotland. Some of our hosts even appear to know more about Scotland than have an understanding of the historic night about to unfold with no fewer than four European ties in Reykjavik on Thursday. On a drich Wednesday morning, you could mistake Reykjavik for Paisley, well if you squint at least, with St Myrne's shirts dotted around the city. A father and son stroll towards the centre in home shirts. There are families grouped together celebrating the occasion, almost in disbelief and groups of supporters of all ages just living for the experience of following their club in Europe, the first time for many of them. A trip to the stadium on Wednesday evening showed that it's not just the supporters embracing the trip to Reykjavik, as Stephen Robinson briefs his players ahead of a light training session. There's laughter as the threat of fronting the cost for Icelandic coffees is levelled at players on the losing team in training, but there is equally a steeliness in preparations. Robinson is far from taking a step back in training as he darts around the pitch during a drill. He's clear in his plans, fixated on achieving complete understanding within his players and absolutely determined not to settle for qualification itself being a success. He's assisted by Dermot O'Carroll, back in Valour where he played for a short spell, Brian Kerr and Jamie Langfield, the latter who can hardly contain his excitement ahead of the European outing, having been at Love Street the last time St Myrne competed in Europe. There is an acute understanding of how much this matters, the players and staff appreciate the bonkers journey fans have embarked upon to reach Iceland, some likely to see more boarding screens for flights than goals. A video message from Robinson is shared with fans gathered in the Dubliner pub in Reykjavik. A St Myrne playlist is blaring. There are fans on chairs leading booming chants and happy hours extended. A small win for bank balances which have taken a battering in recent days. There are familiar faces and friends you have not met, 
but crucially, everyone is united. There's no division, there's no animosity, there's no entitlement. Everyone within the small pub and pouring out into the beer garden are just happy to be there. This has been 37 years in the making. You just have to be here, says another, of the sense of occasion. This has been 37 years in the making. For some, it has been a lifetime in the making. And that goes beyond those fortunate enough to travel and back to fans gathering in the bank house, the cave and the beers back in Paisley. Evening Times Sport, July 26. Paris prepares for Olympics opening ceremony like no other. Paris is preparing for an Olympics opening ceremony like no other on the River Seine tonight. But the action has already got underway in Paris with preliminary competitions taking place in sports, including rugby sevens, handball and archery. The PA news agency looks back at a day on which the eagerly awaited games in the French capital began to creak into life. Carol Hester has signed a letter universally condemning the actions of Dressage Star and protégé Charlotte Dujardin three times Olympic gold medalist Dujardin withdrew from the Olympics in Paris on Tuesday after a video emerged of her repeatedly hitting a student's horse with a whip from the ground during a coaching session. Hester is a signatory to a letter from the board members of the International Dressage Riders Club. Ireland were denied by a second half fight back as New Zealand emerged 14-12 winners in the Rugby Sevens Pool A decider. First half tries from Zach Ward and Jordan Conroy plus a Mark Roche conversion gave Ireland a short 10-0 interval lead at the Stade de France. But New Zealand stormed back and Andrew New Stubbs' late conversion proved decisive. Teenage archer Megan Hivers fired Team GB into Paris 2024 Olympic action when she released her first arrow at the Esplanade des Invalides. Havers, fellow deputant Penny Healy, and Tokyo 2020 veteran Bryony Pittman were the first Britons to compete at the Games. Their preliminary ranking round moved a day earlier than its traditional opening day morning slot due to the venue's proximity to the River Seine opening ceremony. The quote of the day came from 16-year-old archer Megan Havers. I can officially say I'm an Olympian now, so that's really cool. I've got a lot more Olympics in me, I hope, as well, said the 16-year-old. Report by Press Association. Evening Times Sport, July 26. Rangers sign Cherney on loan. Report by Ewan Payton. Rangers have officially confirmed the signing of Vaclav Cherney. The Czech Republic International has joined the Ibrox Club on loan for the 24-25 season. The Wolfsburg forward will spend the campaign playing for Philippe Clément in the Scottish Premiership, but it is understood there is no obligation to buy the player as part of the agreement. On signing for Rangers, he said, It is a very nice day for me. I am happy to be here and I cannot wait to get started. Obviously, from the first talks with the manager, it gave me a very good feeling 
and from there on I would say it went pretty fast. I was happy about the contract and just couldn't wait to come down here and be here and experience it all. Clement commented, I am delighted to welcome Vaclav to the squad. He is an exciting player with valuable experience in European football. He has already shown his attacking qualities during his time in the Eredivisie and at Wolfsburg, and he will further strengthen our attacking options in the squad. I feel as a club and staff, we can continue to help him as a player to reach new levels, and I am excited to see what the season holds for him at Rangers. Director of Football Recruitment Nils Coppin added, Firstly, I would like to welcome Vaclav to Rangers, and I'm looking forward to seeing him as part of the squad. We have been working hard to bring in talented players with potential, and Vaclav is a winger who has proven contributions in top leagues in Europe. It is fantastic to have him join the squad here. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Times Sport, July 29 Bells Hill Badminton Star Aiming High at the Olympics Report by Paul Martin A relaxed Kirsty Gilmer begins her third Olympic campaign today as she looks to progress beyond the group stage for the first time. The Bells Hill Badminton Star Faces Azerbaijan's Keja Fatima Azzara as she bids for the victory, which would set up a winner takes all clash with Chinese He Bingzhou tomorrow. The 30 year old Gilmer has a European Championship silver medal under her belt already this year and will be using the learnings from her previous Olympic experiences in a bid to reverse her fortunes on the biggest stage of all. With the first one, you want to squeeze everything out of it, said Gilmer, who is one of over 1,000 elite athletes on UK Sports National Lottery-funded world-class programme, allowing them to train full-time, have access to the world's best coaches, and benefit from pioneering medical support which has been vital on their pathway to the Paris 2024 Games. Tokyo was a bit strange circumstances, so for this one, I'm just trying to be super confident in all my preparations to be able to play with some freedom and a relatively relaxed outlook, she says. And she continued, it seems counterintuitive to relax on the biggest stage of your life. I've worked pretty closely with a psychologist, and the conversation we have had was about reflecting on Europeans and the unique set of circumstances that big championships bring. The key thing for me in that week of Europeans was that I was unafraid to lose. It unlocked freedom in my play and a fearlessness. In major championships, people can get really bogged down in what might happen or what might not happen. You could have the best week of your life, so allowing for the possibility of that is super important. Elsewhere at La Chapelle Arena, Orkney born Sean Vendy and Ben Lane are hoping to finish with a flourish after their group stage exit was confirmed. The pair were beaten in three games by world number ones Liang Weiqing and Wang Chang in a hard-fought clash lasting just over an hour. After losing the opening game, Lane and Vendy fought back to level matters before losing the decider 21-14 as they slipped to a second defeat of the weekend. Said Lane, Tough day, tough match. We have come out on the losing side of the game twice, but we gave it our all in both matches, in the preparation and build-up to this great tournament. Unfortunately, 
we've just come up short twice. We've got one more match left to play, so we'll give it our all. Vendy and Lane conclude their campaign against Canada's Adam Dong and Niall Yakura. Evening Time Sport, July 29th. Serie A Club Check on the Forgotten Celtic Player Report by Mark Walker Unwanted Celtic defender Gustav Legabilka could clinch a shock move to Serie A with Verona and Parma interested in the Swedish defender. The 24-year-old stopper joined the hoops from Elfsborg for £3 million a year ago, but has failed to establish himself in Brendan Rodgers' side. He is unlikely to be part of the champion's plans this season and looks certain to be on his way out of Glasgow, and he could be heading to Italy after both Verona and Parma registered an interest in Liga Bilke who has been capped twice for his country. Verona finished in mid-table last season and want to push on this term under manager Paolo Zanetti. And ambitious Parma want to make an impact in the top flight, having won Serie B last term and winning promotion. Rogers hinted that the Swede would be leaving soon and said, it all just depends. Gus has shown a terrific attitude. He didn't get so much game time last season, but he's got his head down. He had the chance to go on loan in January, but we needed to keep him due to the injuries we had in that position. He's worked very hard over pre-season and we'll see what happens. You see the players are happy and working well, but all players want to play. If they can't get the game time with us, they may look elsewhere. Report by Mark Walker Evening Times Sport, July 29 Rio Hatati targeted for Leicester transfer Report by Ewan Payton Celtic star Rio Hatati is a transfer target for Leicester City according to a report the Foxes are back in the big time after their championship title triumph last season under Enzo Maresca, who has now moved on to Chelsea. Steve Cooper is the new head coach and he will guide them into the new English Premier League campaign on Monday, August 19, with a home match against Ange Postecoglou's Tottenham. They could go into that match with Scottish Premiership ace Hatati in their ranks, according to the Daily Mail. They state that Leicester are readying a big money offer for the Japanese international. The 26-year-old Hatati joined the hoops from Kawasaki Frontal in January 2022 and made an instant impact on the team by scoring against Hearts and Rangers. He has 16 goals in 87 matches to his name. He suffered a hugely frustrating time last season, spending much of it on the sidelines due to various injuries. Brendan Rodgers will hope to hang on to one of his main players, with the 24-25 campaign set to get underway this weekend. Kilmarnock are Celtic's first opponents. The Parkhead side will be under no pressure to sell, with the player still under contract for another four years. Were Hatati to move on, he would join Abdul Fatawa, Bobby de Cordova Reed, Michael Golding, and Caleb Okoli as Leicester's new recruits. Meanwhile, Rogers has stated Dazen Maida and Nicholas Kuhn are set to be fit for Celtic's league curtain raiser. Rogers shrugged off the concerns following Celtic's 4 win, one win over Chelsea in their final United States tour fixture. Meanwhile, Celtic have rejected Southampton's Matt O'Reilly transfer offer. 
There is strong interest in the Denmark International this summer. The Sun claims that Celtic have knocked back Saints' initial offer. Head coach of the newly promoted English Premier League side, Russell Martin, is a big admirer of the attacking midfielder. He signed the English-born player for MK Dons before he eventually joined Celtic in January 2022 for £1.5 million. Pounds. It remains to be seen whether Saints will come back in for the Premiership star. Italian outfit Atalanta have already had three bids rejected by Brendan Rodgers and company. The Europa League champion's most recent offer reportedly landed at the end of last week but fell short of Celtic's valuation of the player. Evening Times Sport, July 29. Plans for new facilities at Celtic training ground revealed. Report by Catherine Hunter. Proposals to develop separate security and groundskeeper facility at Celtic Park's training site have been submitted to Glasgow City Council. The two buildings will be located at the entrance of the site at Barrafield Training Ground on London Road near Celtic Park itself. If approved, accommodation would include office space, storage and amenities and is known as Phase 3 of a wider development. Separate planning applications, known as Phase 1, have already been submitted by Ryden on behalf of Celtic FC and include proposals for an indoor training facility, modular changing rooms, a gym, reception area and medical first aid room which have already been approved by the local authority. Another application referred to as Phase 2 for a second modular facility including offices, changing rooms and canteen space has been submitted to Glasgow's planning department and is pending consideration. The Barrowfield training ground is used mostly by the club's youth teams for training and matches. The proposed development is one part of a new complex hosting Celtic Boys and Girls Academies and will also be the new dedicated training centre for Celtic Football Club women's first team. In their planning statement, Ryden says, these new facilities at Barrafield will ensure modern fit for purpose facilities are available, meeting the requirements of Celtic and also importantly, football governing bodies. The holistic vision is that the new training centre will feature a new indoor arena, featuring full size FIFA approved artificial surface a combination of outdoor natural grass and artificial pitches and state-of-the-art gym and fitness facilities. Ryden adds, this new state-of-the-art training complex demonstrates Celtic's commitment to the east end of Glasgow and to maintain a significant presence in the local community. Report by Catherine Hunter. Evening Times Sport, July 29. Van der Merwe praised after becoming Scotland's record try scorer. Report by Gavin McCafferty. Scotland head coach Gregor Townsend was delighted to see Duan van der Merwe become the country's record try scorer in their win over Uruguay. The 29-year-old winger marked his 41st Scotland appearance with his 28th international try to overtake Stuart Hogg. After Scotland held off a strong Uruguay comeback to win 31-19, Townsend said, It probably was not as free-flowing a game as we've had on tour and he didn't get as many touches but he finished his try well. We are all delighted for him and it's an amazing achievement in such a short space of time. 
and now he can kick on and score more tries in the future. The try put Scotland 19-0 ahead after earlier scores from Ewan Ashman and Luke Crosby, but the home team claimed the next 19 points in Montevideo. Only some poor kicking from home standoff, Philippe Echeverri, who scored one of his side's tries, prevented Scotland falling behind. Townsend's replacements made a difference and two of them, Patrick Harrison and Pierre Schumann, crossed inside four minutes of each other to turn the momentum around. Said Townsend, it was a real challenge for us. Uruguay came with a lot of physicality and they were winning penalties and put us under pressure. But I felt the team responded well in the first half and then responded well again in the second half. But the bits between we were put under pressure and Uruguay deserved their points on the board. This has been our biggest test and that was one of the reasons we came here to see how this team reacts when they are under pressure and they come through, so we're very proud of them. The togetherness was on show, I think straight after that third Uruguay try, which we conceded. We had an excellent set in terms of kick chase and put Uruguay under pressure and then we got our rewards. I felt the bench did well too, so it shows it's a squad effort. Test rugby is always that. And while there's some areas to improve, there's a lot of pleasing aspects and individual performances throughout the tour and again today. Report by Gavin McCafferty. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Q and Review and to tell your friends about our service 